Crenshaw's List 23 points for fighting the culture war. It's pretty obvious there is a breakdown in how people think and operate their minds here in the world. And today we're going to talk about a list that has been put out to help people have tools to really fight against this overwhelming paganistic method of thought which is infected and taken over everything. In this Bible study, we're going to weigh this list out against the Christian worldview. And so we will be talking a little bit of politics today, and there are two reasons why the church talks about politics. One reason is to endorse something and attach ourselves to a worldly figure, and this is oftentimes very corrupting, but the other is to call out evil. And when we look at our culture right now, it's pretty obvious the prevailing direction of our culture is straight up evil, and we need to call it out. And any time someone is willing to question the prevailing narrative, we should check it out and see how their proposition actually stacks up in comparison to the biblical worldview. And today we're going to do just that. Because a list has been put out by Dan Crenshaw of 23 ways which people can fight against this grotesque culture war. And we're going to go through all the 23 points and just see how they correspond with the biblical worldview. Alrighty, so thank you for joining me. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. This is the Nazarene Stream Preacher. And we'll have some of those Elder Scroll sounds going on in the background. But that's mostly just to add some music and just to have a little bit of fun with things. But let's get to our list, shall we? The first point that we have here is that America is worthy of our love and patriotism. And when we look out through the course of human history, America is pretty unique. You know, the course of human history since the fall, since we left Eden, and we're in this time period now where we're after Eden, but yet we're not to the judgment of the living and the dead, there have been exactly zero perfect nations, exactly zero utopias. And when you look at America within that context, America has been uniquely an instrument for good. And we don't turn it into an idol. It's not the kingdom of heaven. It's not even the ordained nation like ancient Israel was, where it is set apart for the, the purposes of, of God. It is just a, a worldly institution. But nonetheless, it has been unique in advancing a lot of things which are good. It has liberated a lot of people from inescapable burdens, and there really isn't much that we can compare that to in the course of, of human history. So America is actually something which has been a force for good. It is not perfect. It's not a utopia. It never was meant to be. And even in the preamble to the Constitution, it claims it is to be a more perfect union. It's not going to be perfect. Since we have been recording human history from the fall. There have been exactly zero utopias, including the one which was anointed by God. So that's just important to keep in mind. Number two on Crenshaw's list is victor mentality is better than victim mentality. Now, this one is really great because we know in the gospel, Jesus does not come just to be a hellion who deconstructs everything for the purpose of deconstruction. No. Jesus comes to a firm and entirely different way of thinking, and he shows people the way, the truth, and the life. It is something which moves upward towards heaven, not down towards the pits of Gehenna. And we know that the Holy Scriptures say, God will not be mocked. Do not be deceived. A man will reap what he sows. And if we sow victim mentality, you're going to reap victim mentality where you have a bunch of victims and people just ebbing away in pity. Therefore, yes, victor mentality is superior to victim mentality. And when we look throughout the Gospels, Christ is pretty clear in telling us, I come so that you can be co-heirs, conquerors with me. I come so that you can be liberated from the inescapable burdens of this world so that you can be a victor. Not for your own purposes. Again, you know, the, the wrath of man does nothing for the righteousness of God. But that righteousness of God is still victorious and it pulls people up. Regardless of where you started off in life, God wants to pull you up with those upward aspirations so that you can walk in the good, the true, and the beautiful. All right, number three, free speech is absolute. Hate speech is not an objective term. And absolutely, this is very important. Free speech is something which is, is very interesting. And God is in the business of, of letting truth have its day. And if people do things that are sinful, they reap the consequences of that. The whole idea of hate speech and policing hate speech is a Trojan horse for tyranny. Sometimes it's not even a Trojan horse. Sometimes it's just an outright in your face. We're here to, to do tyranny. It has nothing to do with hate. We have to understand that in the modern world, the belief system which has largely rejected God, um, it still accepts its own lowercase g gods, so it's not entirely without its idols, but the one 
true God of all creation has been rejected by it. It needs some way to explain sin and evil. And since it doesn't want to acknowledge sin, and thereby acknowledge God, it calls things hate. Hate is the new sin in our modern day and age. And when people talk about hate speech, they're talking about blasphemy against the spirit of the age. And even though there might be some truth that people say things that hurt others' feelings, um, that has been the case since the fall. And victor mentality is better than victim mentality. We're not capable of policing what people say. Even if somebody wants to, to yell fire, in a movie theater, a lot of times people say, oh, well, there's got to be some restrictions on speech. No. If somebody wants to yell fire in a movie theater, that local community can sort that out. There doesn't need to be a big government policing to try to stop that. Um, the government cannot do that, and the hate speech laws are designed to govern what people think. And as Crenshaw has correctly noted here, it's about a war between the absolute and the subjective. And by that, we mean something which is unchangeably true and something which is an opinion. What somebody calls hate speech is, is purely a opinion. And G.K. Chesterton writes about this. This is the suicide of thought when you no longer believe in objective truth. You know, the laws of, of say, science, the laws of mathematics, these things, they are true whether you believe them or not. And the only way that you can actually believe in that is if you believe in an absolute God. Because you can't actually prove that 2 plus 2 equals 4 empirically. At some point in time, you're just going to have to believe that 2 means 1 apple plus 1 apple. And you have 2 apples. And that's just a law. It just is. Belief in an absolute God produces this sort of belief. If you take away belief in an absolute God, you always get this sort of polytheistic worldview where your two apples is not the same as my two apples, and that's just a bad, bad thing. All right, so moving on to the next one. It doesn't matter what kind of gun you restrict, criminals still hurt people. Let us protect ourselves. Okay, and this is, again, very obvious. Uh, it's in the name criminal. If people are not bothered about breaking the law, they're not bothered about breaking the law. These are only meant to restrict law-abiding people. And it's meant to take away peaceful ways of people having checks and balances. Believe it or not, having firearms is a lot like David cutting off the sword of Solomon's robe, or cutting off the corner of Solomon's robe with a sword. He doesn't actually have to kill him, but he has to have a weapon capable of that force. And that's real meekness, by the way, which Jesus talks about. Real meekness is you have the power to commit some sort of atrocity, but you have restrained that. You see, evil does not respect weakness, but evil can be put in bay by meekness. And when I say evil, I'm meaning something like King Solomon, someone who is a child of God, who has a sin nature, but also was made in the image of God. They, they will respect meekness, but they will not respect weakness. And the Second Amendment is meant to give the American people an opportunity to have, yes, weapons capable of matching the U.S. government to put the fear of God in people who are in elective office so that they do not do tyrannical things. It's meant to stop violence from happening, not to advance it. And yes, you're always going to have violence because there are people who do not abide by the law. So you're going to have people who do criminal things, but you're not going to put together the right magical laws which stop people from having a sin nature. Again, one of the big problems we have in our world is people not understanding what makes people evil and what makes people good. The sin nature that runs through all of our, our veins is what makes people evil, and it is God that makes people good. Okay. Number five, you get to keep the wealth you create and pass it on to your kids. This one is very important because a lot of times people in our world, they have come very cozy with socialism and a lot of the Marxist trains of thought. But one of the things which people don't realize is you don't actually have charity if you don't allow people to keep the wealth they create. And that's one thing which is really interesting because it's not immediately obvious. When I talk to a lot of young people, college age people about this, they get really mad when I tell you this. And it's not till they often go out in the world and start getting married and start living that they start to realize this. 
you do not have charity if you do not actually allow people to keep the consequences of their actions. And what I mean by that is, say you've got a man and a woman who get married. Say this couple has two children. The man, he decides that, you know, rather than me spending a bunch of money on the toys that I want, rather than me buying, you know, a classic Corvette and rebuilding it and then buying a brand new Corvette and having one to drive and one to, to keep as more of a toy, I'm going to save up that money and put it in the bank so that my kids will have it 25 years from now. He can only do that if he's allowed to make the decisions of what he wants with his wealth. But if you go into the Marxist train of thought that says the government, something outside of you gets to redistribute the wealth so that everybody has the same amount, regardless of how much work they put out, regardless of what decisions they make, everybody gets to have the same amount. Well, the problem you have is you'll have one family that has two kids, but say one of the parents has an addiction and they like to spend all their money on an addiction. And there's another family who wants to save up their money for their kids so that their kids will have a, a fund to help them start a business when they're 25 or something like that. Well, if you're under a socialistic train of thought, that's not allowed because one family that spent all their money on, you know, some sort of addiction, whether it be impulse buying stuff online, lottery tickets, you know, alcohol, whatever it is. The, the government will have to step in and say, well, this family over here that's been saving their money, they have too much wealth. We have to steal that from them and give it to the people who've been spending all their money on, you know, eBay purchases, on alcohol and on lottery tickets so that they still have the same amount at the end of the day. What you'll find it is in the socialistic way of thinking, the people who want to save are are punished and the people who want to indulge vices are rewarded and it goes actually deeper than that it's it's more than just saying if everybody works equally hard they get the same amount because a lot of times people will come back and say that and that sounds very good if everybody works the same amount they get the same amount of pay but not everybody produces the same amount of of work and somebody's paycheck is not a measurement of how much their soul is worth. A lot of times people say, well, we need to give people $15 an hour because they're worth more than $7.25. And my response is, yeah, they are. Let's have a conversation about how much the human soul is worth because you're insulting the human soul if you say that it's worth $15 an hour. You're insulting a human soul if you're saying it's worth $50 an hour or a hundred. There's not a monetary value for a human soul. Somebody's paycheck does not value them. You're valued because you're made in the image of God. You know, I'm a preacher. I do not make a lot of money. I make similar money to what I made back when I did construction. Um, I've also worked real estate, which made a lot more money per paycheck. Um, I've worked a lot of different stuff. Being a preacher at a rural church is not something which has a huge income with it, but also I'm much more blessed and much happier with the work that I'm doing. So obviously what somebody does with their life and what their paycheck is are, are separate. You're not really valuing somebody based on the quality of their soul when you give them a paycheck. And that's just illogical to think that. But also, if somebody does do work that is inventive and say somebody makes an invention, say somebody invents a wheel, what they do makes life easier for everybody else. What they have done, the work they have produced is actually more valuable because it can save other people money. It can save people time. And it's okay to give that person more money for the more valuable item they have produced. So the love of money is certainly the root of all evil. And we have to be careful about valuing people based on money because that is a form of loving money rather than loving the soul. And we have to just be honest about these things and make sure that we're, we're thinking clearly like God wants us to and not just coveting. Okay. The government has no right to shut down your business and invade your home without due process, even in pandemics. And yeah, this one's very easy, very straightforward. 
It's not the government's job to solve all problems. The government is not capable of it. It's not their role. And yes, they don't, it's not the government's job actually to solve what goes on in a pandemic. Um, throughout human history, we've known it's actually not possible for a government to solve that. How in the modern world we've created this crazy farce where we believe it, I don't know. All right. Number seven, women should not have to compete against men in women's sports. Yeah, I think that speaks for itself. That one's really obvious. Um, really impressive ladies out there doing some athletic stuff. You know, there's a girl I used to like in high school who is, I'm six foot tall, like six foot even. And this girl was, was taller than me by a little bit. She was obviously played basketball and she was extremely good at it, an extremely good athlete. Um, and she went on to play in college. But, you know, a women's basketball team is very different from a men's basketball team. Even the, the way they play sports is a little bit different. Um, so it's fine to let women have women's sports and men have women's sports. And again, this actually is about objective reality more than it's about some sort of attempt to be fair. This is about um, the transgenderism, which is trying to break down um, some fixed things in reality. All right, number eight, voter ID to vote is not racist, it's common sense. And yes, this is common sense. And you'll also find there's so many double standards on what needs an ID and not. And it also is the uh, tyranny, the bigotry of low expectations where you think that somebody can't go out and get an ID. People can get an ID. This is, this is a scam. Um, and it's sad that people would be expected to do so, so smallly in life. The, the children of God regardless of where they come from, regardless of what their birth circumstances are, they deserve higher aspirations than, than the farce that this lie tries to purport. Number nine, borders and national sovereignty are not racist or xenophobic. Yes, you know, I've done whole programs on this. One of the reasons that we have borders is to keep tyranny restrained. We have a big problem with shoes being made in sweatshops. You only have shoes being made in sweatshops because we have a global market for shoes. If you shrink that market down to where I'm buying a shoe from somebody who made it within my county, the chances that that shoe is made in a sweatshop goes down dramatically because one, the shoe company is going to have to, well, they're not needing to supply that many shoes so they don't have to turn it into an assembly line of people where people are the machines. They're going to be doing it with, you know, a handful of employees, and they're probably not going to be sweatshops. Yeah, you can still have wicked and evil bosses like that, but it's a lot easier to hold them accountable if they're 15 miles away from my house than if they're 15,000 miles away. Um, one of the reasons that we have borders is to restrain evil, to keep economies more situated with cause and effect relationships, where again, we're not having shoes made by slaves but we're actually doing that with the people who will buy the shoes and make the shoes living next door to one another. The more local things are, the easier it is to keep evil restrained. And also, you don't want a, a dictator who's over a million people. It's easier to keep that dictator restrained if he's only over a hundred people. You might think that there's strength in numbers, therefore a hundred million people can lash out against a dictator easier than, say, five people, but that's actually not true in the real world. In the real world, if you've got four kids up against one bully, um, the four kids are, are likely to, to handle that a lot easier than if there's a hundred kids with a malicious principle. You know, the principal is probably not going to be held accountable by, by an entire elementary school where one bully, you know, kids might have the courage to, to stand against that. Alrighty, next up we've got, oh, what, what really is probably one of the most important ones on this list. You can't have freedom without order. Order without law, law without morality, morality without religion, or religion without God. That is true, and even the people who are trying to destroy our, our culture and try to replace Christianity, they know this is true. They don't disagree with this, they're trying to change what is God. This is just absolutely true. You do not have freedom without order. And so wicked people, they want to be the ones who break this entire system down because they say, well, we will give you as much freedom as we want because we'll be the ones who control order. We'll be the ones who control the law. 
And by controlling the law, we'll pretend like we control morality, which, again, morality, religion, these things are very closely connected, and we're going to control that which sits at the top of the moral compass. We see this everywhere in our nation. This being inverted by the diary of hell. Without God, without an objective metric of, of good and evil, you will find yourself in a really, really bad place. God is an absolute God. You will find that people do not believe 2 plus 2 equals 4 when you take away belief in an absolute God. And we're seeing that happen in real time. You cannot have the, the effects of Christianity without Christ as its cause. And the whole idea that we should even care about the oppressed and the marginalized, that comes from Christianity, Jesus seeing a man called Matthew and not just a tax collector or a sinner. Yeah, it does. Without caring for individual souls on the moral and religious spiritual level, you do not care about the poor because if you just believe that you've reached some goal, if there's equal distribution of outcomes and everybody is equal, you can satisfy that by, by killing everybody and putting in a mass grave. And while people might say, oh, well, we don't really want that, well, then what do you want? What is the driving principle? Because if your goal is just equality of outcome, you will like mass graves. You will like gulags. You will like concentration camps. You will like things which tear down and go down to the pits of Gehenna. If you like things that build up, you will recognize that we can be together as one society, one assembly of people that are collected together for a common good. But there will be a body with many members. There will be eyes, there will be ears, there will be hands that do very delicate things. There will be a right hand that's you know skilled at one thing, a left hand that may be skilled at another, and there will be feet that are really good at walking, but not so good at, at the fine arts. If you have upward aspirations and you understand the proper role of the individual and the collective, you realize there are going to be different outcomes. And the only way you can really do this is by belief in an absolute God. You take away that belief in an absolute God and you have nothing. Nothing at all. Okay. Let's keep going. Innocent until proven guilty, not the other way around. So obviously, this is a very good principle. You actually see it displayed in the Gospels. Uh, Nicodemus, who is found in John chapter 3, he comes back again in John chapter 7, and he makes the case that people are wanting to crucify Jesus and kill Jesus just because they hate him, and they're coming up with all of the fake reasons to do that. And eventually they say something like, hey, He's from Galilee and Nazareth. There's no good people that come from there. Check the books. You'll find that no prophet has ever come from there. And they use this like it's a serious way to disprove Jesus as the Messiah. And Nicodemus comes along and he's like, hey, are y'all really going to convict somebody and kill them without evidence that's you know, better than that? And they kind of clap back at him and they're like, you're from Galilee too. Therefore, you're also a piece of trash. And it's just really dumb. It's really dumb, and it's really obviously dumb, but yet this whole wicked line of thinking is very powerful, and it gets away with its diabolical, fiendish you know, behavior. It gets away with it a lot. And actually, I want to apply that to the news, because when we start with the premise that people are naturally sinful, the news is not truthful. Um, and a lot of times it comes with this mentality that we know with certainty that something is guilty, that this fault is here. And without even putting any evidence into it, without even putting any investigation, they, they just assert stuff. And they play double standards with this too. And we are really stricken by a version of America right now that doesn't believe innocent until proven guilty. All right, let's keep going. Stand for the anthem. Oh, wait, we've gone too far. Uh, personal responsibility is a virtue. Yeah, it is. When God made Adam and Eve, they both had an independent mind. Oh yes, they needed one another. Quite literally, the species will not survive unless Adam and Eve take one another as man and wife and have children. They, they need one another on a lot of levels. They need the love from one another. Not just 
sensuality, but they need the the neighborly love. They need the you know husband and wife love. They need all of those things because they're complex creatures. They're not a rock. They're not a bird. And even though birds might mate for life, they don't think and reason the same way that Adam and Eve did. God gave us minds to think and be stimulated. And the reason why this is very important to this particular idea is because God gave them personal responsibility. They were sufficient to stand, though free to fall. They were completely free to fall. But they had a mind where there was personal responsibility, and that's the only way that real love can take place, is if there's this personal responsibility that says you can think for yourself. You don't have somebody decide for you how you're going to think. It is God who wants people to think freely and have personal responsibility. You know, you can look throughout the Gospels, whether it be the shepherds who receive the message from the angelic host that there's a child born. God says, all right, there's a child born. Go over there and see it. Be personally responsible to getting yourself up and going and checking out this baby and see if it's the Messiah. Go find out. When Christ ascends into heaven after resurrecting from the grave, he doesn't just snap his fingers and say, all right, the world's back to being the Garden of Eden. No, he charges the church and says, look, there's going to be a lot of suffering. The purpose of life ain't to avoid suffering. It's going to be a lot of suffering and chaos and sin out there. But you go out and with the responsibility I've given you, you heal the sick, you cast out the evil, you declare what is good, true, and beautiful, and you baptize people into the church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Get on with it. This is your responsibility. And by the way, in case any of you were confused and you thought that, you know, maybe Peter and, you know, maybe John, we like John, he's young. We're going to say those two apostles, they do that work, but the rest of us are going to sit by. No, when the Holy Spirit come on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God, you know, that third person of the Holy Trinity come and made it pretty clear. The tongue of fire is coming to rest on you. You have personal responsibility. Because when Jesus sees a man called Matthew, when Jesus sees a woman next to the well, he sees souls that he wants to transform and they get to think freely. They get to be fully sufficient to stand for the good, the true, the beautiful, or they can be free to go back into sin. And they will deal with that and the consequences of that and there will be a judgment of the living and the dead, but they are free to do that. And God wants you to be thinking and using your personal responsibility for the good. He's not going to micromanage or take away your will. Alrighty. Never give in to cancel culture. Yeah. Don't bow down to people who are telling you they're here to rule you. Don't. There's no virtue in bowing down. I'm going to do another study here soon on the story of Solomon and the two mothers who come before him. And one of them has lost a baby, the other is baby has been stolen and Solomon doesn't know which is which and he, he says, you know, we'll split the baby in two and find out who the real mother is and in the end, he figures out who the real mother is and doesn't split the baby in two. But Solomon doesn't give in to the lies. Jesus doesn't give in to the lies. If people are trying to get you to bow down to something which is not true, don't. Do not give in to cancel culture. Don't. Alright, number 14. The founding was in 1776, not 1619. All right. It's important to push back on the 1619 narrative, but you've got to you've got to be prepared for it. I don't think they chose the year 1619 for the 1619 project out of rebellion against 1776. I think they chose it out of rebellion against 1620. It's one year before that. In 1620, is when the Mayflower landed there at Plymouth Rock. And they had that document wrote there in, I believe, November of 1620. It may have been November 20th. I don't remember the exact day of the month. But they wrote this letter that was called the Mayflower Compact. It was a charter for what the colony would be there at Plymouth. And it said, in the name of God, for the glory of God, and for the advancement of the Christian faith. America was not this secular separation of church and state, meaning God is not allowed in the public sphere, but the devil is. It was 
a new document which says the government is not going to come tell us how to believe. We are instead going to come advance the Christian faith and that will tell the government how to operate. And we have to ask ourselves, because that's the real question I think that comes between the Mayflower Compact and the 1619. They've tried to pull a trump card by saying, ah, but there were slaves here in 1619, so your Mayflower Compact is null and void. It wasn't really about advancing the Christian faith. It was about doing something evil. But we have to ask ourselves, what was unique about America? Hmm? Did slavery exist before 1619? Did America invent slavery? What about that Mayflower Compact? Was that something unique in history? What was the unique attribute of history? And even if you do get to the Declaration of Independence in 1776, what is unique about America? Was the slavery unique? You know, America ended slavery, which was pretty unique in the course of human history. That Mayflower Compact was unique. And it, it set in motion the wheels that would end that slavery in 1619. Don't let them pull the trump card on you by saying, in 1619 the slave landed, but in 1620 the, the Christians landed. Don't, don't let them try to pull that date on you because what was actually unique? You know, we were, we were sinful in 1618. People were sinful in, you know, the year 18. And going back 1618 years before Christ, people were sinful. The fact that sin exists doesn't change what we already knew about the fall. But in response to sin, there were pilgrims who went out. And it gives me chills to read the Mayflower Compact. You know, in the name of God, for the glory of God, for the advancement of the Christian faith, a journey into the unknown. To the northernmost parts of Virginia that we might establish the colony Plymouth. You know, it's... it's a totally different worldview. You know, half of them died that first winter, but it, it probably was not a surprise to them. People had done expeditions before and missionary journeys. Very rarely did people come back alive from those things. Very rarely did most of the party return alive. People knew that when you stepped out in that voyage into the unknown, you were most likely going to die. But they had the courage of conviction that said, no. We fear not death, not that which can touch the body or soul, but the one that can destroy body and soul in hell. Not the things which come to tempt, to come to snare. We fear God alone. A voyage into the unknown. Nor death nor snare has any power over us. It's, it's just, it gives me chills to think about their philosophy. So... All right, stand for the anthem. I'm gonna let that one kind of stand for itself. Oh man, now I've done made some sort of rhetorical um, joke here. You know, standing for the anthem, why are people kneeling for the anthem? Is it because of honesty or is it because of manipulation? It's pretty obvious that the people who are trying to kneel for the anthem, they're being dishonest about history. And they're just evil and corrupt. So yeah, that's, that's fine, number 15. Number 16, the policy that favors one race over another is not social justice, it is racist. And yes, this is true. One of the things which kind of fascinates me is I've noticed that throughout human history, a lot of times people will look at a situation and say, you know, we've been cleaning the fine china teapots with hammers. And every time somebody cleans the, the china teapot with a hammer, it breaks. So our solution to that problem is we're going to clean the hammers with the teapots. And then they find that in throwing the teapots at the hammers, they still are breaking the teapots. Um, the correct solution to the teapot and hammer not meeting on good terms and the hammer smashing the teapot every time that happens is to say maybe the teapot and the hammer should not be encountering one another. And how this relates to this is there's a lot of people who say, all right, in the past it's been bad that one group has, has enslaved another. And that is indeed bad, wicked, and sinful. God did not create us to be slaves to one another. And even when you find in Galatians, when it's talking about we do not use our, our freedom for self-indulgence, but to become slaves to one another, that is not at all meaning that you go out and you capture somebody 
and you force them to do labor for you. What that is saying is you use the freedom that God has given you to be free from those inescapable burdens. And through the charity of Christian love, you bind yourself to your brother and sister in God so that you together may stand firm against the wiles of the devil and have great honor in your heart when you come before God on the day of judgment. That is obviously not meaning to be forcing one another into labor. But back to our point here. We have to understand social justice is not what it is often purported to be, and a lot of people have sorted this out. Social justice, it is not a gospel-motivated righteousness. It is not. It is a set of beliefs that is here to replace Christianity as the religion of people. There's no accident that it is in religion departments that you can find a social justice degree. And it's political. It's entirely political. And it's not the same thing as even the 1960s civil rights movement where it wanted people to be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. It is entirely opposite of that where people are indeed judged by the, the color of their skin and not the content of the character. If one group of people is represented largely in prisons, and you don't like that, social justice says, well, even though somebody committed murder and we watched them commit murder, we're going to let them get off because there's been too many of them in prison. But that doesn't actually make people better off. That actually just lets a murderer out to go commit another crime. And also, trying to overpunish one group because there's not a lot of, of murders in their group, that doesn't help either. And this whole thing is a scam, and it's very, very wicked. It's best to treat people as individuals. I find it fascinating that the same people who say you cannot be colorblind are the same, pe or the same people who say it's bad to stereotype also say it's bad to be colorblind because um, you're essentially telling people to stereotype. If one group is, is considered oppressed, there's this magic rule that says nothing they do can make them anything but an oppressed person and if somebody is a oppressor there's nothing they can do to stop being an oppressive man or woman so this is obviously evil and it's meant to replace christianity it's not this morally innocent gospel driven thing though a lot of times it will prey on christian virtues it'll prey on things like the prophetic work of, of prophets of old it'll prey on some of the christian virtues but it is not a collection of them it's a reversion back to the old paganism where certain groups of people have access to truth and others don't. One's superficial characteristics predetermine whether they are inherently good or evil. Um, that is not gospel-driven at all. Okay. It's Latinos, not Latinx. Yeah, inventing stuff for over, over other people because you think they're offended is, is, is very dumb. Um, less abortion, more adoption. I mean, the whole argument that abortion is health care, that's not rooted, rooted in logic, reason, or evidence. It's rooted in emotions, and we want abortion to be health care. It's, it's wielding a narrative, which is the work of the devil. It's not rooted in anything truthful. Only women can be pregnant and breastfeed, so that actually goes back to the last thing. It's okay to lose in competitive sports, and second place trophies don't help anyone. Okay, yep. Um, God is a God of objective order, and there are causes and effects. Okay. Number 21, more police, not defund the police. So... These are actually different arguments. More police is a different argument from do not defund the police. And I know that almost sounds like a duggable negative that gets weird. The whole argument of defund the police is a Trojan horse to cause disorder so that people can then come in and give order. I mean, that's basically what it is. I mean, it's more than that. It's, it's a bunch of pandering too, but, but it's, it's malicious. More police can actually be malicious too when you consider that the government is 
um, not sanctified by being the government, but at the same time, bringing more order is is a good thing. So there's push and pull. There's there's reasons why more police can be good, reasons why more police can be bad. And that's actually a separate issue from the not defund the police because the defund the police, that is a specific slogan pinned to a specific ideology and a specific set of, of ideas. All right. We don't tear up the past, we learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. That speaks for itself. This list is not exhaustive. Yep, that's also good. There's a lot more to be said on all of these topics. So we've looked at a lot of stuff. And I want to end with a second little piece of food for thought, aside from that list. Not everything in the world has to be argued. We are going to have to start making arguments and realize you can't split the baby in half and make everyone happy. Oh, you can split the baby in half, but you end up killing the baby and everybody's left with something which isn't really that good. In fact, it's, it's evil. Not everything has to be argued. And it doesn't certainly have to be argued on the terms that it's presented to us. When we do battle with unreason, untruths, and outright lies, we have to be wise. If someone comes to your house and accuses you of theft, sometimes the best thing for you to do is simply say, No, I am not a thief. You are a liar. Don't spend time opening up your car's trunk and going through every plastic bag and saying this is why this item is here, this is why this item is here, this is why I bought two sponges rather than one, and yes I know the pack of bubble gum is small but I promise you I didn't, I didn't get it. And even if you have your receipt on you, if you come out and show them the receipt, you have allowed evil and destructive allegations to lead you around. You've allowed them to be in charge of your time, choosing what you do and do not talk about, choosing what you do with the air you breathe, and you've allowed yourself to give in to the untruths and destructive allegations. And besides, if you, say, lost your receipt, well, then you might be up, up, you know, a, a creek. Sometimes you just have to denounce stuff and not even entertain it. And to expand that a little bit, if someone comes along and says, you are an immoral person, for purchasing that item. I see you over there with your plastic bag. You don't care about the planet or others. You also would respond to that by saying, no, you are a liar, you are not God, and you neither know my heart, nor do you know if me choosing not to purchase this stuff would actually help the earth or harm the earth. You don't actually know. You're just an accuser. You're a hell raiser. Big problems are not solved by the devil's petty accusation game of narrative casting. You do not have to entertain stuff. You do not have to be led around by it. If something is a wicked accusation, it's okay to just say that's ignorant and dumb and I'm moving along. I love you, but you have told me you're not willing to hear my words, so I'm shaking the sand from my sandal and moving on. May God have mercy on you, and if you want to repent, I'll love you and we'll forget it and we'll move, move forwards in the gospel. But no. God is a God of objective truth. It is the devil who uses narratives as weapons. All throughout Old and New Testament, God will come along and say, go out and see. Go see. Go see if there is a child in a manger. Find out. God will say something like, you know, Jonah, go to Nineveh and see what happens when you preach the word. It's the devil who comes along and says, did God really say? The devil is the one who likes to wield the narratives. Christianity is built on an objective truth that Christ rose from the grave after three days of being in the tomb. Either that is true or it is not. If it is true, suddenly all the, the narratives, the stories, the songs, the creeds, they become really important. If it's not true, then none of those things matter. And we have to understand that it's evil. It's the devil and his demons and evil people that come along and make statements like, did God really say? Jesus, he said he was the king of the Jews. Don't put a sign on the cross that says he was Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Let it say that he claimed he was. He allegedly was the king of the Jews. That's the devil's game. You're not going to beat the devil at it. God is the one who says, go out and see if there's a child. Go out and look at my fruits. 
John the Baptist, you're not sure if I'm the Messiah? Look, look at the fruits. Do godly people do these sort of miracles? Or do sinners do these sort of miracles? Do godly people preach a gospel of the kingdom of heaven? Or do wicked people preach a gospel of the kingdom of heaven? Is God good, true, and beautiful? Or is the devil good, true, and beautiful? Go out and see. God wants our minds to be open, to be transformed by his image so that you are sufficient to stand and love him, but also free to fall. It is the devil who wants your mind to be closed and beaten into submission, where something else, something other than your mind thinks for you, where you are nothing but a slave who waits in anxious ignorance. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we're going to wrap up this program for today. I thank you for spending time with me. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. Here at the Nazarene Stream Preacher. And, you know, Parlor is back up and running. You can check me out on Parlor at J. Dylan Proctor. And on that note, God love you and have a blessed day.